Uh, this talk is going to be focused uh, mostly on um, the new code that I'm building, why I'm building it, what it'll do, and uh, how I'm going about that. And uh, I think it does uh, work in nicely with a number of the other talks that uh, we've been hearing. And, um, and so the, the overview is that I'm doing stars. Uh, they are spheres. And, uh, and I'm planning to exploit that uh, with this new code. And, um, and, and I'm looking at a particular phenomenon. And whoops. No, no, now I've done it. I pressed the wrong button. Oh, that's terrible. It's the end button. <laughs> so don't worry, I'm not going to, I mean, oh, I'm not, you know. <laughs> oh, we've, we've, we've got, we'll get back there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I do this when I lecture, and it's terrible. Um, oh, I mean, you're seeing it. Just close your eyes, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is the slide I wanted to show. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to um, simulate are events that happen in stars uh, that are relatively brief, uh, but they're not as brief as other events in stars that we've heard about so far uh, in the conference. So uh, these are not explosions. Uh, but they are important events. And so I just have uh, an illustration here, sort of from the middle of one of these events, uh, to explain uh, the display. On the left, uh, what we see is the amount, the concentration of material from this outer sort of reddish uh, region that is being uh, pulled into the central part of the star. And the central part of the star is hotter and denser. And uh, this outer part uh, contains unburned fuel. And so if you can pull it in, then it will burn. And, uh, and it will burn uh, in a way that is sort of unusual because that material sort of wasn't meant to be there. Uh, it's in this material we're pulling in, in this case, is hydrogen and we pull it into a convection zone uh, where we have helium and carbon in a mixture. And so this is a zoom in showing you in a thin slice uh, the way this stuff gets pulled in. And so here along the edge, uh, this is the top of the convection zone. And, and I think the best way to think about it in terms of how it behaves uh, in, in a fluid dynamic way is to think about it as uh, the top of the ocean. And uh, it's a sphere, just like the Earth is a sphere. And think about this as sort of a deep ocean of denser stuff, and up above is kind of an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is lighter, it's hydrogen, uh, and this denser ocean is helium-carbon mixture. And uh, there is convection that is going on here uh, that is pulling the stuff down. And you can see the vorticity here. Uh, and it's better in the animation that I'll show in a minute. Whoops. I, I didn't do end. <laughs> uh, you can see that it is coming down uh, right here along that line that you could see the material being pulled down. And then down below, you just see this uh, mass that looks like steel wool or Brillo pad or something. And this is just a turbulent fluid. Uh, so in terms of doing a computation like this, uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, we first of all have to uh, put the entire star, this entire central region, into the computational volume. And uh, the reason for that, as you'll see in a moment, is there really are global modes of behavior. And, and so we have to have the whole thing in there. And then we need to uh, also have enough resolution that we can see these uh, detailed entrainment processes that occur uh, just along the edge. So this is the vorticity picture. And before I sort of animate it, 
You can see that here where I'm, uh, I, I hope you can see the cursor over there, is it? Oh, you can't. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, well, hmm. Well, there is an outer sphere, and that is sort of the problem domain, which is spherical. Uh, and there is a confining sphere that holds the thing in. And then the next sphere inside is the top of this carbon helium ocean. Uh, you can uh, see, you get a sense of an inner sphere, which is a carbon oxygen solid core of this thing. Yes. The trouble with the pointer is I can't, someone pointed a red pointer at me once and I've never seen red pointers again, uh, ever. I'm sorry. You can see them, I can't see them. <laughs> I don't know quite what happened, but I see lots of other stuff, uh, but just not red pointers. Uh, so anyway, I will animate this now. And what you see along the left-hand edge is a, uh, it's sort of a wave and the way to think about that is like a tsunami that is traveling along this ocean. And you can see uh, that it goes down. It is bringing material down. And it gets to the other side of the star, and then there's this stuff that comes up. OK, and so uh, here you can see the entrainment. This, this is the concentration. And you can see the wave of stuff being brought down. Uh, and then when that latter sort of thing is harder to see uh, in, in the material entrained. So that is uh, a, a picture of what's going on uh, just as this star is really sort of working into, you know, getting going. And toward the end of the calculation, it looks more like this, uh, which is kind of uh, a bigger deal. And, and we have material, uh, oops, that's it. We have material being, um, being brought down uh, in great quantity. And uh, at this end, we had to stop the calculation because of this confining sphere. Uh, it becomes completely artificial. Uh, whereas you could see that in the earlier animation, uh, there's essentially nothing going on near our outer boundary. And so we should be getting all the right answers uh, in the interior. But when we get to this point, uh, essentially, because we're holding it in, this star does literally explode, uh, but it would not do that uh, in reality. So we have to improve upon that, and, um, and I'm building a new code to do that. Uh, this is just a, a slide to show that the Mach numbers involved here start out kind of on the low side of about 0.05 and work their way up all the way toward the end. Uh, at two Mach three. And so what, what I want to do is to set out uh, to build a code that can uh, use an adaptive grid uh, so that I can have a coarse grid and take that confining sphere out, say a factor of two in radius. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to use a fine grid also to look at the particular places uh, where I'm entraining the, the fluid, which is a sensitive area. It'd be nice to have a little more resolution on that. And, and so this is just a, a notional diagram of how I might use uh, grids like that in an AMR context. And uh, what I don't want to give up is what I have on Blue Waters Now, which is the ability to scale a problem like this, like the one I showed you, uh, to 14,000 nodes. And, uh, and then use up my whole year's allocation in one week, which I'm planning to do <coughs> in a few weeks. <laughs> well, you know, if possible. Uh, and, and so the, I just want to tell you a bit about um, how I am designing this. And, uh, and, and the, the point of hearing this is that I'm trying to uh, sort of rise to the challenge to not give up those 14,000 nodes. If, if I went down to, say, 1,000 nodes, uh, the scaling problem becomes much easier. Uh, and I don't want to give up anything. I want to run on each node as fast as I can. And uh, that's another talk, which is uh, in the paid session later in the day.
Uh, so what I've done is to simplify the problem and take advantage of the geometry of these stars that I'm doing is that I've decided that I'm going to chop them up as I do now with the uniform grid into a whole bunch of pieces uh, that are the same volume and that are nice beautiful cubes. And uh, I'm thinking that I'll need about 32,000 of those. Uh, with the run that I showed you, I had 110,000. But I, I had four of them uh, on each node, and now I'll have one on each node. Okay, so about 32,000 will get me to the same level uh, as I was at before. Uh, but the problem is that with these different grid levels, uh, and I'm limiting it to three, and I, I, I hope that just seeing the pictures that I showed you will convince you that three is enough. You know, I could use five, uh, but then if I filled in the coarse ones, uh, it would run in the same period of time, and you've got plenty of memory, and so why do that? Three is easier, uh, and it creates a load imbalance, uh, because in principle, I could have one of these bricks that only had the coarsest grid on it, and I could have another one that had the, all the finest grid, and the difference in time to update them uh, would be a factor of 256, okay? And uh, that is saying the difference in time to upgrade, update them for the same time interval. I would need to take four time steps on the fine grid, two one time step uh, on the coarse grid. And so I want to be able to do that. And uh, I'm thinking that, well, gee, you know, in terms of grid cells, I've got a factor of 64 uh, possible difference. And I've got lots of threads uh, on each node, and I'm really targeting the next machine these people will have, and I'll have a hell of a lot more threads uh, on each of those nodes. And so I can assign an appropriate number of threads uh, to a grid that, uh, you know, a brick that has an appropriate number of grid cells inside it, and uh, accomplish uh, on the node uh, a dynamic load balancing that it, I'm doing in my code anyway, even now, uh, by just assigning the right number of threads to do the right amount of stuff. Okay, so this is just sort of going through. They always save the slides, so I have all the text so you, anyone who ever downloads it might read it later. Uh, but generically, I'm assuming that I'd need about half the volume uh, to be on a coarse grid, uh, and then say three eighths on medium, and so on. If I go through this, all the work is on the fine grid. And uh, I, my coarse grid bricks uh, will be these you know, very small numbers of cells. I'll update them in a 256th of the time. And so my intent for the load balancing is that I'll take the coarse, you know, entirely coarse uh, bricks, of which I'll have lots of them, like half, and I'll sprinkle them around to balance loads. I'd be able to move them because they have very little data associated with them. I'd just send them around with MPI. And so this is a, a, a problem that I'm targeting for next year. And the idea is that if one goes to all this trouble and puts all this stuff in, uh, one ought to do a more complicated problem. And so this is one that arose in our collaboration with Falk Herwig's group in Victoria, Canada. Uh, and that is that what if we had two of these burning shells uh, with two of these entrainment places? And is there anything interesting that could happen? So they came up with a 1D uh, calculation with the two flat spots there uh, are showing you the convection zones. One is above an oxygen burning shell, one is above a carbon burning shell, and in between there's this tiny little sliver of stuff. And it's been a question uh, for really decades, what happens to that tiny little sliver of stuff? Does it just stay there, you know, if it were a one-dimensional problem and, and you had only tiny little eddies? Uh, it would. Uh, but we see that we have this entrainment, and so maybe we could eat through it. And if we ate through it into that carbon burning shell, uh, we would be eating into this fuel that would burn explosively if we brought it down. And uh, something interesting undoubtedly would happen. And I want to see the movie 
uh, and I hope I will show it to you next year. Uh, but the idea is that with three levels of AMR, I should be able to do this problem. I could divide it roughly in half and put a mid-level thing on the inside and a course on the outside, and then I could take my fine grid and, and use it uh, judiciously at those entrainment uh, positions. Uh, okay, and so uh, that's just going through the numbers of what that is. And what I want to tell you about is uh, a, a basic problem, which is, I thought it was on the next slide. Oh, wait a minute, I must have uh, Oh, well, I thought I had it. Uh, the basic problem is that when I do AMR, suddenly uh, I'm reducing a lot of my bricks to costing uh, 256 times less work. And uh, if you think about scaling, uh, this is a disaster. You know, if you think about it in terms of, you know, saving time and getting things done for less money, I mean, well, it's not my money, but somebody's money, you know, that's a wonderful thing. But in terms of scaling, it's sort of a disaster. Uh, because I have to pack 256 of this stupid little coarse bricks uh, onto one node uh, to equal the load where I have one of my biggest bricks. And so it turns out that the number of nodes I need for a calculation like this drops from 20,000 to 3,000 because I've got all of these trivial little, little bricks to update. And 3,000 is just, well, it's not good enough. You know, and so uh, one thing I can do is, of course, uh, I could put in some more bricks. But I'm not changing the problem. So to put in more bricks, each of the bricks gets smaller. And that is also sort of a disaster in that that is a, a really a big challenge to update that efficiently. But I have all those threads, and so I think I can do that. So I've decided, well, I'll go from my present 110,000 bricks, I'll go to 2 million bricks. I mean, what the hell? And, you know, a lot of them will be uh, very small. I'll be able to pack them together and get them done uh, in a small amount of time. And so uh, if I do that, what I want, I, now I want to scale. And uh, I've, I've got enough bricks to go onto all of these nodes, uh, but what I do for the uniform grid is I update some bricks while I'm passing messages and I never ever pay anything for con you know, the communication and the code. How do I do that in this case? And this is an illustration of what uh, my uh, plan for that is. And that is that I will exploit the fact that stars are spherical and that the gravity on these central parts of stars is really, really strong. So unlike the supernova explosion that you saw uh, yesterday, if you saw it, uh, you know, it could sort of meander and go from one part to another. This can't do that. Gravity is much too strong. I mean, you saw what it did, and I mean, it was violent and, and, and it was cool, but it did not change computational loads from one side of a star to the other. So what I can do is I can chop my star in two, and I can divide those into uh, what I call brick populations, A and B, and it's like a red-black type of uh, uh, technique if you think about uh, you know, implicit solvers. Uh, I'm gonna update all, uh, you know, one half of a star, and I can update it all uh, just knowing information about it. And the other half of the star is irrelevant. And then I, while all the messages uh, wend their way to wherever they're going, I update the other half of the star. And the only problem is on the cleavage plane. Okay, because I have a, one plane of bricks, uh, and that turns out to be like 1% of the bricks I have, uh, but these bricks have to communicate with both populations. And so uh, what I've done is come up with uh, a way that I could update them, uh, which is illustrated here, which is a little bit uh, hard to read maybe, uh, but a way in which I could update them where I could still completely overlap uh, all of the messaging and uh, therefore pay no penalty whatever uh, for the communication. 
and it's sort of shown here. Uh, oh, damn, I don't have, uh, so I have the left hand half of the diagram on the left uh, that shows the different update levels uh, for population A, and then population B is over on the right. And uh, these sort of curvy lines are, uh, are showing that well messages have to go. And right at the cleavage plane, there are a few messages that have to really get where they're going very fast. And uh, to arrange that, uh, what I have to do is to take those, just those bricks, and uh, chop them into two pieces, uh, and do the minimal part, which is just a little slice of them, uh, and update that first and send those messages off, and then do the rest. And, uh, and I think it's gonna work, and I think it's going to scale uh, just perfectly. Uh, at least that's my goal, and you know, uh, I would say, I don't always get to my goal when I said I would, but I usually get there, uh, eventually. And uh, so I think that is going to work. The trick is that those special bricks, I pretend that they cost twice as much because I have to do this crazy thing to them. And they don't cost twice as much. They cost 1.13 times as much. Uh, but I'm gonna let it be two because who cares? It's only 1% of the bricks. And so the point is that I'm aiming this thing uh, for scale. And of course it should run well if, if I don't have this scale, uh, but at scale it should really uh, do quite well. So this is just uh, how many bricks have I got. Uh, I have you know, those 32 cubed, actually I've divided them into 97 cubed for this harder problem and for the faster machine. Uh, and uh, so that means I have 1% of uh, those problematical uh, of bricks, but I'm going to be able to scale this up uh, to 12,000 nodes I think I had here. Well, maybe this one I think with 97 I can go up higher. Okay, and so uh, I will tell you how I did this uh, in the paid presentation, but this is the other part of it. Uh, you know, so first what I've said so far is I'm gonna have this three level AMR. I'm gonna do it in this special way which will overlap uh, the messaging and uh, do all the dynamic load balancing. And uh, then I'm gonna make each one of these updates run really fast. And uh, this is sort of a how fast uh, as far as we have it right now. And uh, so we have uh, adapted this algorithm uh, to the GPU uh, using CUDA. We've tried other things so then, and they don't work for us. Uh, we've used CUDA. And what we get out of this is uh, if you sort of did some arithmetic on these numbers, uh, you would find that we are getting about eight times the performance uh, out of a Pascal GPU uh, that we get on an entire CPU node of Blue Waters. And so, uh, well, maybe they won't buy that, uh, but that code is gonna run really fast uh, on whatever there is, but uh, interestingly enough, it runs only half as fast on the night's landing. And uh, there is an explanation for it, which is, said here in bold on the right, and that is that each one of the little SIMD engines on Knight's Landing and Pascal on our code is performing exactly at the same rate. Uh, it's suspicious, maybe they're identical. Uh, and we get one SIMD result of 32 results every 11 clocks, uh, or 12, somewhere in between 11 and 12, uh, out of both devices and they seem, you know, from their descriptions, they're totally different, but maybe not. Okay, so um, I th have I run out of my time? I, I'm not sure I ran out of my slides. <laughs> okay, so the, you know, the, this was to uh, go through and, and say that I'm going to do uh, one of these bricks and I'm gonna update the whole thing 
uh, for four time steps on the finer grid. And the finer grid is sort of the rate limiting thing. It's sort of like one unit of work is take an entirely refined thing, uh, do it for four time steps. I'm gonna do that without talking to anybody else via MPI. And so there is an overhead associated with that. And it scales with the size of the, the, size of the brick. Uh, with the present machine, uh, the brick ideally or semi-ideally should be 96 cells across. Uh, on another machine, if I went to 128, I could make it more efficient. Uh, but the rate of efficiency doesn't, I mean, it only changes linearly with that. So it's not a huge change. And so I am viewing that overhead, uh, which works out to be between 22% and 38%, which are numbers which I hate, they're too large, uh, as a cost of AMR. Because without AMR, I would not need to do that. Uh, but with AMR, what that does is it gives me time, right? Uh, you know, I spend longer updating each brick, which gives me more time to make decisions about which brick should be where and where, what should be done for load balancing and everything else. And what I pay for it is between 22% and 38%. Uh, but what I get for it is 3,000 nodes worth of work uh, rather than 14,000, you know, whatever that factor is. And so I think it's a good bargain. Um, and uh, more or less, that's the bargain uh, that I've gone with. Uh, and I think that's really all. Uh, I'm, I undoubtedly have more here to say, but I'll stop. Okay. Okay.